Hi, I'm Carl Crumley, and uh, this is my first time recording a tutorial of this nature, so bear with me. Uh, and I've chosen an image for this demonstration today that I have blandly titled Lehman's Hardware in Kidron, Ohio. I tend to be uh, pretty matter of fact in naming my images because I long ago ran out of different ways to say things like autumn reflections or summer sunset. So for the most part, I now give my images accurate but pretty boring names. Well, Lehman's Hardware is located in the middle of one of Ohio's largest Amish communities and is usually bustling with Amish shoppers as well as tourists. My wife Liz and I arrived in town one quiet Sunday morning back in October when there were no tourists around and the Amish were all in their worship services. I noticed that Lehman's had a 1960s pickup truck on display with old gas pumps and with fall decorations, corn stalks, pumpkins, and fall flowers, and it was really a colorful display and I wanted to capture it. So I chose a location that took advantage of the nice low angle side light coming through a small part of the sky that wasn't cloudy. I parked across the street and composed the image to incorporate the key elements of the truck and gas pumps, the store sign and the fall decorations, and I eliminated as much of the distracting surrounding elements as I could. I bracketed my exposure so that I could produce an HDR, high dynamic range uh, image if, I, if necessary, to capture the full range of light in the scene, but these days I mostly shoot brackets to ensure that I have a, the best single exposure that will allow me to post-process that single image using the powerful tools that the latest version of Adobe Camera Raw affords. For those of you who don't know, uh, Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw use the same processing engine, so if, uh, if you use Lightroom, you have access the, to the same powerful tools as Adobe Camera Raw that I'm using in this demonstration today. In this case, uh, I chose one of my bracketed images that was one and one-third stops overexposed according to the camera's metering system. That exposure gave me the latitude to show detail in the shadow areas and still recover enough detail from the highlights to produce a nicely balanced blend of image information. The uh, Zero EV or correct exposure would have worked fairly well too, but I was noticing a, a, as I was looking at the image information that the uh, plus one and one third exposure was nearly two megabytes larger in size, telling me that it contained considerably more image data than the uh, zero EV or the correct exposure. So it would give me a better final result as long as the highlights weren't blown out. And they weren't. Um, Can Adobe Camera Raw is amazing in its ability to pull usable detail out of almost blown highlights. Uh, let me show you here. Let me uh, pull up the uh, the uh, bracketed images and, and bridge. And again, for you Lightroom users, uh, some of this will look fairly familiar to you. Um, the bridge and Lightroom are similar. Uh, bridge is the older version. Uh, the uh, uh, Lightroom is is really a uh, an evolution of uh, Bridge and Adobe Camera Raw and a much uh, cleaner and neater package. And I probably should have uh, switched to Lightroom when it first came out years ago, but I didn't do it. I've stuck with, uh, with Adobe Bridge. And uh, I don't regret it. It works fine. But uh, it is a little different than what most people see when they do their editing in Lightroom, since Lightroom is a very, very common editing uh, software package that's uh, very effective, and I recommend it, by the way. I always tell people uh, who ask me uh, what image editing program they should use, and they're, when they're just starting out, and I always recommend uh, Adobe Lightroom. I think it really is, um, is, is a very powerful tool, and, and you should use it. Uh, so uh, don't do as I do, do as I say. I say use Lightroom, but I'm using Adobe Bridge and Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw. Anyway, here are the three images uh, that I bracketed. There's the, uh, the darkest image, the minus one and one-third image. Here's the, um, the correct exposure, the zero EV image. And here is the, uh, the plus one and one-third image. Uh, the overexposed image. And here's why I decided, even though I looked at the uh, the zero EV or the correct exposure and decided I really liked it, it looked good, um, I noticed that the image size is 22.76 megabytes. And when I look at the uh, plus one and one third image, I see that the, uh, the image size is 24.52 megabytes or almost two megabytes larger. So that tells me that uh, this overexposed image has a lot more data in it. And the reason for that is, is pretty complicated, and I'm not going to get into it here, but it has to do with the linearity of digital sensors, that they capture most of their data in the, uh, the brightest part of the, uh, the scene. In other words, uh, the, to the right of the histogram. You'll hear uh, photographers often say you should expose to the right, meaning expose uh, as bright as you can without, um, without blowing out highlights. So blowing highlights is an important aspect of this to make sure we haven't done that. And when I looked at this image and looked up at the highlight area, the sky up in this area and the side of the building, 
I thought, well, you know, I'm not sure there are any highlights I can recover, but let's pull it up in Adobe Camera Raw and take a look at it. So to do that in Bridge, I, um, I click on the, uh, I right click on the image that I want to bring up in Camera Raw, and you see it brings up this, uh, this little menu here, and I go up to Open in Camera Raw. So a new window opens, and this is Adobe Camera Raw 8.7. Notice that it's telling you that I shot this image with uh, my Canon EOS 6D. And a couple of other things I want you to take a look at here. Un these are the, uh, the, the various tabs uh, that are available to us for different editing functions in Adobe Camera Raw. One of them here is called Lens Corrections. You notice that it pops up the little, uh, when I hover over it, it says Lens Corrections. I click on that. There are three tabs under there. One is Profile. It says Enable Lens Profile Corrections. I always make sure that that is checked because that, that allows Adobe Camera Raw to read the data, the EXIF data that is attached to the raw file in the, that came from the camera. And it tells it that I shot this with a Canon EF 24-105 uh, F4L IS lens. A lot of technical data, but basically a Canon 24-105 uh, zoom lens and it makes some automatic corrections for some of the uh, uh, anomalies in that lens. I'm not sure anomalies is the right word, but for some of the distortions uh, that, that that lens uh, produces. If I turn that off, you'll notice that, that the image tends to change a little bit. And when I click it on, you see that it tends to uh, bloom out a little bit in the middle uh, to correct for uh, some distortion that that lens has uh, inherent in that lens. Under the color tab, you'll notice that it also have remove chromatic aberration check. I always um, check that uh, to make sure that there's no chromatic aberration uh, in the corners of the images, primarily where it shows up. And I won't go into a discussion of that now, but um, I always make sure that remove chromatic aberration is checked. For some reason, Adobe never programmed Adobe Camera Raw uh, to automatically leave these checked. Although you saw them both checked when I pulled it up just now, but I have already manually checked them and, and uh, th those check marks have remained. But had I just pulled this image out of the camera and, and brought it in, those boxes would not have been checked and I would have had to have checked them. It's kind of an annoying feature that uh, I wish uh, uh, Adobe would, uh, would fix in future issues of Camera Raw 8. Uh, 8. whatever, 8.8 .8 that comes out or 8.9 when it comes out. Anyway. Uh, let's move back over to this tab, which is the basic editing uh, tab. In this tab, I can make some most of the changes that, that uh, are necessary to, to bring this image into uh, um, a form that, that will be pleasing to my eye. And I also want to make sure that I do have some detail in this highlight area up here. And the way to find out, I look up here at the histogram and I see that, boy, it really is way over on the right side. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, grab the highlight slider down here and move it to the left as far as I can until I start to see some highlights coming into the sky. And I don't see enough there, so I'm going to take the exposure slider and move it down to about, uh, let's see, about there. And now I can see some pretty good detail in the sky, so it is there. Let me zoom in on it a little bit here just so I can see. Yeah, looks like pretty good detail in the area. And I'm going to fit it back in view here so we can look at it again. So basically what I've done is taken the, uh, the exposure that was one and one third stops overexposed and pulled the exposure down about one and one third stops or about one and a quarter stops here, pulled it back down to the correct exposure. Well, why not just go ahead and use the, uh, the zero EV exposure then again, because there's two megabytes, megabytes additional data in this image than there was in the, uh, the zero EV image. That's because that sensor, again, captures most of its data right up here in this, in this top 10% uh, of the, uh, the histogram area. So having done that now, when I pull down the exposure, I, I tended to darken this area under the overhang and in this window and under the uh, eave of the building. So I'm going to pick up the shadow slider and move it to the right a little to recover some of that shadow detail that was lost when I pulled the exposure down. And also, in looking at the histogram now, I notice that since I have pulled the exposure down, I actually have a gap in the histogram over here that there's, uh, it's not quite reaching the far right side. So I'm going to grab the white slider right here and move it over a little until the histogram touches the, uh, the right side of the, uh, of the edge here, until the curve touches the right side of the, uh, the, the little box. 
And now there's a couple of other things that I would like to do that will improve this image. In my opinion, the clarity slider is your friend. I find that the clarity slider, which uh, if I'm told increases mid-tone contrast in an image, tends to do a really nice job. If you uh, bring it up just a little bit, the mid-tone contrast uh, in the image uh, t uh, comes out and it looks uh, a lot better. Let me bring it back down to zero just so you can see what I did. There's before, there's after. I don't know if you can see that very well, but it really did increase the mid-tone contrast and made it look pretty good. The uh, vibrance slider, vibrance affects uh, the saturation of colors that are not normally saturated. Uh, now obviously red is saturated in this image and the yellow is saturated. You can just take a look and see that those two colors really uh, jump out at you when you, uh, when you look at this image. Vibrance will tend to bring up the saturation of the duller colors. So I'm going to turn the vibrance up a little bit. And that has brought out some of the color in, uh, in the side of the building and some of these areas over of this awning over in this area. Another thing I like to do is turn the saturation up just a little bit, but not overly, overly much. The, the uh, red and the yellow are pretty saturated, but I'm going to bring them up just a little bit more so that the red even pops more than, uh, than before. So those are basically the edits that I make in Adobe Camera Raw, and essentially this image is finished. If I click on Open Image, it's going to come up in uh, Photoshop. Now, when I hit open image, uh, the image will, will come up in Photoshop and we can take a look at it over there. So I'm going to click that and give my computer just a moment or two to, uh, to render this image. We're seeing the uh, final finished image on the screen while, uh, while we wait on this one that's coming in from uh, Adobe Camera Raw. And there it is. I said pretty much finished, but you know, one of the first things that I always do to an image is crop it. Uh, cropping gives us one more chance at a good composition. So I'm going to crop this image. I notice in looking at it that it's, um, it's pretty much a uh, panoramic uh, uh, orientation. It's, it's a pretty wide image and not very tall, especially if I eliminate some of that road and sidewalk in the foreground that's, uh, that, that doesn't have a lot of interesting information in it. This is going to be pretty much a panorama. And uh, one of the standard uh, ratios that I like to use in my images is two to one. And the reason for that is I have uh, some pre-cut mats and frames I use at uh, Image City Photography Gallery that have 12 by 24 openings in the mat. So I typically display 12 inch by 24 inch uh, prints. So I'm going to crop this for 12 by 24. So to do that, I go over to the, uh, uh, the cropping tool over here and on the left side of the image and I, 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 the left side of the screen, I click on that. And then I'm going up here under ratio and I'm going to tell it the ratio that I want. I'm going to say I want 24 inches wide by 12 inches high. And that produces this uh, cropping block that you can see. I'm going to move that around until, let's see, oh, that pretty much does it. Now, so I'm eliminating, I'm going to eliminate all this foreground uh, of the road and some of the sidewalk that's really unnecessary that I don't need. So I'm going to click the, the check mark up here and now the image is, is cropped. Um, looking at the sky, all those power lines are really distracting. I don't like them at all. Um, this you can you, you could argue that they were there and um, in the scene you could leave them but uh, a lot of photographers, me included, uh, when we uh, look at, a, at an image and decide what, how we want it to finally look, our, our artistic vision says those power lines ought not to be there. So um, I'm going to take them out, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this uh, tutorial showing you that because it's a long process to do that. Um, to do that, you have to come in here to the uh, uh, spot healing brush, click on that, Take it over here and pick up those power lines, cover them, paint over them, and then Photoshop eliminates them. So that would take quite a long time for me to do all that. So I'm not going to bore you with that at the moment. Uh, I have already done it. So let's bring up the, uh, the image. Uh, let's see here, right here. So this is what the image looks like after I have gone through all the cloning process of removing all those uh, those wires in the uh, in the sky, and it uh, it looks pretty pretty darn good. I'm I'm really pleased with this image, but and I'm ready to put it away and say, gee, this is a good image to print and uh, display in the gallery. 
And then as I look at it a little more, I say, you know, there's some things that still bother me about this image. And one of the things that bothers me, let me click on this little thing here, is um, the, the top of the sign is right at the edge of the image. And also I notice over here on the right that this uh, um, mm, shutter, as I, I couldn't come up with a word there for a moment, but I'm sorry, the shutter on the right side of this window, or actually the left side of the window, the right side as we look at it, is cut off. It's right on the edge. I don't like that. So I wish uh, that when I composed this image and shot it, that I had left a little more uh, room, that I had aimed the camera up and to the right a little bit, so I would have had some room above the sign and some room uh, beside the, uh, the, the shutter over here. I didn't do that. I only uh, took one series of uh, shots, one three-shot bracket, and then drove away. Uh, which is a mistake. I should have taken time to uh, carefully compose that and make sure that I had the, um, the composition that I really wanted. Uh, the good news is uh, Photoshop gives us a chance to, um, to make some corrections to our compositions. Uh, first by cropping, which I did earlier, and secondly by doing something called content-aware fill. Now, I normally wouldn't recommend this, but um, in this case this image really can benefit from it. To, to do that, to add some, some content above the sign and some content of the image over here to the right of the shutter, I'm going to uh, click on the cropping tool again. And uh, what I'm going to do, hmm, let's see here, let's uh, right click, put clear ratio, let's set that crop down on the bottom, I set this line up on the top, and there is what I would like to have. I'm increasing it and saying, gee, I'd like to have some, some image in that area. And I'd like to have a little image over in this area here to, uh, so that that shutter is not right up against the uh, right side of the frame. That's what I wish I had shot when I was there. Now I'm going to allow Photoshop's Content Aware Fill to fill in this area. To do that, I'm going to pick up the uh, Rectangular Marquee Tool come right in here to this far upper corner see right about there and drag it down to the far left corner so now basically what I have done is select the image and now I'm going to select the inverse which will select this white area around the uh, top and right edges of the uh, of the image so I'm going to go to the select tab at the top up here pull down to inverse now you see the little marching ants, as they, call, they are called, are highlighting this area of the uh, image that I would like to increase and fill in with some, some data. Now, Photoshop has a very powerful um, feature in it called Content Aware Fill. If I go over to the Edit tab and click on it and come down to where it says Fill and click on Fill, it brings up this little window and it says we're going to fill in using content aware. In other words, it's going to look at the pixels around that area and try to mimic them as much as possible and fill in that area to make it look as natural as possible. Let's see how good a job it does. Let me click on OK and let's watch what happens. Now it's uh, the computer's thinking and there it is. It popped in. Notice how it filled in that area, and then you know what? It did a pretty good job. Let me deselect. I believe that's Control D. Yes, Control D deselects the uh, um, the area, and now we can take a look at it. If we look around the sky, you can see it did a really good job in that area. Not such a good job above the uh, Lehman sign and above this window over here. That's kind of squarely looking. I don't like that. But now the roof line looks good, and down through here looks pretty good. And down through here looks uh, pretty good, except now our uh, shutter is way out to the edge and we really want that shutter to end there. So let me show you basically what I did without going through uh, the long process of, uh, of doing all this because this, would, this is probably 30 minutes worth of work to do these things. But I'm going to show you how I fix these things like the little area above the Lima sign, the area above the uh, right window and the shutter. Let me show you what I did and then I'll show you the finished uh, image without uh, spending a lot of time here uh, boring you with that. So let me go to view 100%. This is letting us see the image at actual size here, 100%. And there's that distortion of the uh, area above the layman's sign. And to fix that, in fact you notice that it also made the uh, to, the uh, siding on the building look rather warped and so forth. So this would take some time to go through and clean all this up. 
But basically what I did was I went over here to the, uh, the clone tool, the clone stamp tool, clicked on that. Picked up uh, some pixels in an area that looks similar, like this area right down in here looks like that. There's a nice clean area of uh, siding that I could come up here and click into this area and do some things like this and, and start to clean up this, uh, this part of the image up here. It's a pretty uh, long process to do all that, but that'll show you roughly what I did to clean that area up. Now the other problem I have here is if you notice this window on the left has uh, um, this drip molding or whatever over the top of it, whatever you call this, and the right side that's missing because that part was cropped off. So I need to duplicate that on over this window over here. And to do that, since I do have a window that, that is very similar over here on the left, I go to the clone stamp tool and I select this area right here and say that is the source of the pixels that I want to copy and move over to this area right here. And now you see I can start to, to fill in that uh, the top of that, that area over the window. Now this is not long enough as you see. It ends right here. Let me slide this over so you can see. Uh, because of the perspective distortion, the, uh, even though those windows are probably exactly the same size, uh, the one on the right appears smaller. I'm sorry, the one on the right appears larger because it's closer to us. So I have to go over here to the right side and pick this area up here as, as my clone source for the pixels. Say I want to copy those pixels and move them right over here to this area. And there we go. Now I'm a little off there, but that gives you an idea of what I did to fix that area above the window. Plus I had to do some things with uh, uh, the siding up here to clean that up. Now let's look over here and see if everything looks good uh, on the right side. Um, Content Aware Field did a very nice job of filling in this area with uh, uh, the, the uh, metal roof. And it did a good job down through here. It looks pretty good. Eh, kind of chewed up this gutter a little bit here. So I'm going over to the clone stamp tool. I'm going to uh, pick up uh, pixels from this area right here and clone them over to this area to fix that gutter. There we go. That looks pretty good. This area is mm, a little mixed up, but it's okay. But here's a major problem. We need to uh, not make that uh, right shutter quite so wide, do we? This is uh, kind of an advanced technique I'm going to use here, but uh, uh, bear with me. I'll show you quickly how I did it, and then uh, we'll, we'll just finish up this, uh, this tutorial so it doesn't get too long on us. But basically what it, uh, I did was I said, okay, I want this to be the end of the, uh, the shutter. So I select an area here, and I decide to clone in pixels from this area on the left side of the shutter here, put them over into this area. And I did that little selection so that only that area right there receives the uh, the pixels that I'm copying over. And as you see, that starts to make it look like uh, the, a natural right side or end to that, uh, that shutter. I need to uh, extend that further down. Kind of like so. Now let's uh, go back a little. Let me zoom out a little bit. Now you see I need to, let me uh, hit Control D and deselect that area. Now I need to uh, make this area right along the edge uh, look like the wood siding of the building. So I'm going to go over here. In fact, let me reselect. If I go up to select and pull down reselect, now that area that I just worked on is selected again. You see the marching ants around that area. If I go to select inverse and now everything but that area in the image is selected so what that did is if I decide to pick up pixels from this area over here so this piece of siding looks nice and clean and over here and I can pick up these pixels so I'm targeting that area right there and I'm going to clone those pixels over to this area there we go you see it's not erasing that area, the edge that I just made over there. Not bad. Control D, deselect, and there we go. 
So that obviously does do a lot more work than that to, to make it look as natural as possible. But now we look at the scene. Let me uh, show you what, the, what it looks like when it's finally done. There's the, uh, the final edited image with the additional space above the, the sign with the uh, top of the uh, right window looking more normal now. And with this uh, shutter uh, finished off over here in the wall. So now I have that room over here that I didn't have an, as I took the photograph. In other words, I should have composed it properly and gotten the image more correct when I shot it, but I didn't. But I'm, I'm pretty pleased with this now. I think that uh, um, this image is pretty well finished. I'm happy with it. Um, it probably tells some sort of story about uh, uh, the past merging with the, with the current era or something of that nature. But, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not much of a, a person to see what the story in a photograph is when I shoot the image. I just see that there's a, uh, an attractive scene that I like and I want to capture, and I capture it and let the story tell itself later. I think I'm more of a skilled craftsman with a good eye than I am so much an artist that, that, uh, that tells a story with his images, but I, I'm sure my images do tell a story uh, when, they're, when they're completed. I just didn't see the story at the time I took it in most cases. Anyway, I, I, I saw the scene. I liked it. It was very attractive. I shot it, and I, my processing, I think, is, is pretty good. It, uh, I think it looks good. I'm happy with it. I'm looking forward to displaying this, uh, this image in my gallery uh, sometime in uh, the year 2015. So thank you very much for your time in watching this, and I uh, hope you enjoyed my very first effort at uh, doing an online tutorial on, uh, on photographic editing. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye.